A Snake in the Grass, A Wolf at the Door by Black K Cat, Chapter 3. Orochimaru returns from a mission to the north 28 days after Jiraiya's reappearance in Kanaha to find that they've given his former teammate a good name to him. He has already proven that he does well enough with children, Saratobi says during Orochimaru's debriefing when he passes the news on. There's a wary sort of resignation in his voice, but it does little to ease Orochimaru's mind. He left, Orochimaru wants to say. He left for three years, abandoned Kanaha without so much as asking permission, and now he that he's returned. You reward him? In all truth, he can't even say why the thought of it unsettles him. Jabaya has yet to seek him out. Though, granted, there's been little time for such things. Between him settling in and Orochimaru being called away. And the other man has already made it clear just how little priority he gives their old theme. Perhaps it should be no surprise at all that Jiraiya is moving on, eyes already fixed on the next bright opportunity rather than the shadow that is his former teammate. Sarutobi is still watching him, eyes dark and faintly sympathetic, though thankfully he offers no platitudes. You encountered no problems? He asks, because if nothing else, Sarutobi has always recognized the signs of Orochimaru's mind working, knows when he needs time and space to stew. <laughs> Gratefully, Orochimaru accepts the change of subject, inclining his head. Only mild, he affirms, and after the complete disasters of his last four solo missions, that's close enough to, no trouble, to count. There was increased security on the outpost, and I assume someone had warned them of an attempted infiltration, but I was able to get in and out unseen. Zardobi frowns worriedly, and Arujimaru is more than capable of seeing just what's going on at this quiet sabotage. Someone wants him either dead or disgraced, though he can't quite fathom why. Well, the Sangname says with forced lightness. You have three weeks mandatory leave after this last spate of missions, and I believe Sagamo has time off as well. Do you have plans? Orochimaru shoots him a sharp look, clearly communicating that the old man is not nearly as subtle as he thinks he is, and then looks away out the wide windows of the Hokage's office and to where the academy class is just getting out. The children are... very small. It's hard to remember that he was once one of them. Easier now, though, with Sakamo and Kakashi beside him. I had thought to look for Tsunade. He admits after a long moment, conscious of the heavy silence lingering between them. Unspoken words, he thinks, though he has no notion what they might be. I heard passing mention of a blonde gambler with poor luck on my way back, and I would like to know that she is... She would like to know of Jiraiya's safe return. As ever, Sarutobi doesn't call him out on the mid-sentence switch. He is quite familiar with Orochimaru's habits after nearly 20 years in close proximity. Indeed. He says gravely, faint, wry amusement in the lines of his face. It would ease my mind greatly if you could find her, Orochimaru. I will have a pass waiting for you tomorrow morning. But please inform Sakuma before you leave. Last time you left without a word was quite exciting for all involved, and little Kakashi will miss you terribly without a proper goodbye. Orochimaru makes a face because what Sabuner Toby is actually saying is more along the lines of let Sakamo accompany you or I will push you on diplomatic missions for the rest of the year. Only Sarutobi would never be so upfront about it and therefore feels entirely justified making use of base emotional blackmail. There's a reason he's one of the few Shinobi Orochimaru truly respects. I will let him know. Orochimaru allows reluctantly, finding a grimace. He is 25, one of the strongest shinobi in any of the elemental countries, and does not need a babysitter. <laughs> However, after a year of knowing Hatake Sakumo, Orochimaru is aware that if he vanishes, Sakumo would likely overturn the entire village and surrounding countryside in search of him, and not subtly either, especially given the last four missions Orochimaru has been on all of which have gone to hell in some truly spectacular ways. Sarutomi doesn't quite say, I'll prepare another pass then, but it's hovering unspoken in the smile he feels to hide behind his pipe. Very well then, is all he says. Consider yourself dismissed and I'll leave. Thank you, Orochimaru, and good work. Orochimaru rises to his feet, carefully concealing the stiffness in his leg from the last near miss. 
A shot le wound, but a good part of the reason he hasn't protested his long leave. If Sarah Toby notices, or heaven forbid, Sagamo, those three weeks will likely become three months, and Orochimaru will go truly go mad. He's not about to spend any more time trapped in the village with Jiraiya and all the things he represents than he absolutely has to. Tsunade will know if he finds her. Tsunade always knows. He has missed Jiraiya these past three years, Orochimaru thinks, pausing outside the administration building. He's missed Jiraiya, but always with an edge of, if only, added on. Because for all that Jiraiya is, was to him, like a child, Orochimaru has always wanted more. More of his attention, more of his time, more of his rivalry. That's something very much like what Orochimaru assumes friendship to be. Just more. With Tsunade, though, it's not like that. Things are easier between them, and always have been. Tsunade is frequently exasperated and often violent, but has never treated Orochimaru with the edge of fear, amazement, awe that the rest of the village does. Even at their first meeting, she took one look at him, put her hands on her hips, and demanded to know why he was so pale, and didn't he ever go out in the sun? Because vitamin D is important, and she wasn't going to be stuck with an idiot who couldn't even remember that much. Orochimaru had stared at her, stunned speechless, and Zorotobi had laughed. So had his mother when he told her later. It was base association to think of his mother when he thinks of Tsunade, though they hold different places in his life. His mother was tall and pale and willow wand slender with bronze eyes to Orochimaru's gold and the same raven hair. Nothing at all like Tsunade in looks. But they both cared, both smiled in the same manner before something stole their smiles away. Orochimaru's feet carry him to the cemetery without conscious thought, as thought of his parents always tends to do. He picks his way between the altars without pause, sure in his course after so very many visits here, and it is a relief. Others might find the place eerie, especially in the descending twilight, but Orochimaru can't, not when this is where his parents are. He loved them to the point that it almost broke him when they died together the way they would have wanted it, but all the harder on an eight-year-old boy regardless of or perhaps because of his genius. It's hard for him to remember their faces sometimes, harder still to remember scents and sounds, though he knows his father's voice was low and soft but deep, that his mother smelled of dry scales and oleander from the poisons that she brewed. She was pure-blooded, the last such of the clan, and his father was of Kiri stock, but they'd been happy together, strong and steady, for all that they always stood slightly back from the rest of Kanaha. Orochimaru had been a precocious child, he knows, quiet and tending more toward books than social interaction, and they had given him his space, let him be, and yet always been there when he needed them. Always, right up until the mission that took them away from him. He crouches before the marker, pleased to see it's still free of weeds and dirt, and passes a gentle hand over the irises growing on either side of it, a purple so dark they're nearly black. Mildly poisonous, too. He likes to think his mother would approve. She was always so fond of natural poisons. The white snake skin he found here that first terrible morning he woke up alone is still with him, still carefully preserved and kept under glass as a symbol of his resolve. He wants, even now, 17 years later, to see his parents again more than anything. Wise and kind and beautiful and deadly, he misses them, and ache and a wrench whenever he thinks of their absence, no matter how much time passes. But someday, when the wheel turns again, they'll be reborn, and Orochimaru will find them. He will. And until then, he'll be a shinobi, as they were, as they always wanted him to be, and he'll rise as high in the ranks as he's able to make them proud. The sabotage will be dealt with. Orochimaru isn't the type to leave anything to chance. A footstep crunches in fallen leaves, and Orochimaru raises his head, eyes narrowing in barely hidden offense. This is a graveyard, hardly the place to talk of business, and there's nothing else this could be. After all, he and Shimura Danzo have no other reason to be speaking. You're a difficult man to find, Orochimaru.
Danzo says, his voice affable, though there's some sort of undercurrent that Abrujimaro can hear but not quite make out. Erosin has been keeping you busy, I see. Orochimaru wonders if the man will take a hint if he remains silent, crouched before a grave, but he doubts it. Tanzo only shows tact when it suits him. I am a shinobi, he says after the silence stretches for a long moment, thick with something that's almost anticipation. I go where I am needed, when I am sent. Another moment, and he pushes smoothly to his feet before turning to face the older man, resisting the urge to cross his arms over his chest. That's Jiraiya's gesture, and never has the same effect when Orochimaru uses it. Did you need me for something, then? Danda smiles at him, and a gesture that should be warm and wise is only flat and hard. Orochimaru supposes he's grown accustomed to Sakamo and Kakashi's smiles, warm and open and clearly happy. I had heard, he says, voice heavy with concern, that you've been having trouble on your missions, Obergemar. After assessing the situation, the only conclusion I can come to is a distressing one indeed. And I'm afraid the culprit can only be a Kanahan in someone strategically placed in the records or assignments division. I thought it best to warn you before you risk yourself again. The wound in Orochimaru's thigh, where a kunai from a supposedly loyal informant had stepped deep into the muscle, twinges and flares with pain. He doesn't let it show on his face or in his body, but it takes more effort than it should, not to flinch. Over the last year, more missions than not have gone abruptly off course, and Orochimaru is very, very tired of it. He's good at what he does, brilliant at being a shinobi, even if being a person is harder, and he can usually manage to turn things around well enough to accomplish his task, but often it's been far too close for comfort. It started with a mission to retrieve Sakamo's team, and Orochimaru can still see it in his mind. Sakamo sprawled out on the ground and bleeding from the gut, his face leached of color and his eyes too dark for his face. That was the first incident, but not the last. Too close. Too many times for both Orochimaru and those around him. He hasn't dealt with the situation yet, hasn't tried more than perfunctorily to hunt down the culprit, and a large part of that is not wanting to find that it is indeed a Kanaha Shinobi, one of his comrades, plotting all of this. But Orochimaru is suspicious, not just by training, but by nature. He likes to twist words to push at people until they move the way he wants them to, and because of that, he always expects the same of others until proven otherwise. Sakamo is perhaps the only person in the village from whom he expects blunt, straightforward honesty, as the other man has shown that particular trait many times over. But Danzo is not like Sakamo, not in the least, and Orochimaru can already feel his ankles going up. Too much time spent with the attack clan, and they're Damnable summons he thinks to himself with faint, wry amusement. Maybe, had he been injured on that first mission with Sakamo, as he was clearly supposed to be, he would be too much in pain, too deeply mired in his anger to consider the whys of Donzo coming to him. But Sakamo took that blow for him, could have died from it, and right now Orochimaru is entirely clear-headed and capable of a possibly more than healthy dose of suspicion. Danzo shouldn't be asking these questions. He shouldn't have access to the records. Shouldn't be approaching Orochimaru instead of the investigations squad if he does. This isn't how Kanaha is supposed to work. But then, Danzo has always skirted the very edges of the law. Saratobi has complained about it more than once. But he says nothing, keeps his peace, and waits the other man out. And indeed, barely ten seconds later, Danzo is stepping forward and dropping a broad, firm hand on Orochimaru's shoulder in a fatherly motion that Orochimaru loathes, especially done here before his real father's grave. I would like to invite you to join my special squad, Danzo says warmly, though the emotion in his voice doesn't reach his eyes. Root, they're called. We look out for our own Orochimaru. If you accept, we can find this traitor and bring them down. Ah, Orochimaru thinks, eyes narrowing as the pieces connect. So this is what he's after. He sees it, understands the manipulation in a way he usually wouldn't. Perhaps it's been good for him, after all, spending so much time around Sakamo and those Sakamo calls his friends. 
Now, Orochimaru can recognize what's supposed to be on a face, what emotions are typical. Even more importantly, he can also see the lack of them. The only thing in Danza's eyes is greed. I will think on it, Orochimaru murmurs, even as he takes a step back and slides smoothly out of Danza's grasp. If you'll excuse me, I believe I have another mission to prepare for. Consider the offer carefully. Danza says, almost jiding as his eye narrows faintly. I believe you would do very well in room, my boy. You have potential, but right now, you are a dulled blade. Root will sharpen you, make you more than you are now. You could be great, greater than your teammates by far. I'll be waiting for your answer. He inclines his head politely, then turns and walks away, sure-footed over the uneven ground, despite the cane in his hand. Orochimaru watches until Danzo is out of sight and beyond the range of all senses, and then he turns, takes four steps, and vanishes in a whirl of leaves. The sky is violet gray, the horizon just touched with gold, where the sun is sinking the last few millimeters below the horizon, and the nighttime breeze is picking up, cool and scented with jasmine. Twilight turns the plants and paths of the garden to gilded shadows, and Sagamo knows that he should pick Akashi up and start heading in for the night, but he's too relaxed, too peaceful. Kakashi also looks perfectly content sprawled on his stomach in the soft grass as he plays with a pack of origami dogs a Ruchimaru has made for him. Sagamo watches him bark and growl softly as he moves the small paper creatures in incomprehensible patterns and smiles to himself because this is a moment of inner peace he'd never thought to have after the death of his wife. Hatake clan members tend to mate for life and have a habit of following each other to the grave. When she had died, Sakamo had felt as if his entire world had been wrenched away from him and he had floundered. Only Kakashi, newborn and helpless, had been enough to keep him on solid ground because Sakamo loved her, yes, but that wasn't the only problem. He needs to be needed, needs it with an intensity that leaves him reeling and breathless, especially since his wife's death. Without that, without some form of regard from his fellows, without knowledge that he is in some way valued and valuable, well... Without that, Sakamo supposes that he would not be anything at all. Perhaps it is shallow. Perhaps it is the height of foolishness. But a wolf pushed out of his pack is quick to fade away entirely. He remembers seeing it happen before, with his mother after his father's death. He'd been newly made a Chunin, considered adult by the rest of the village, and therefore no longer in need of parents. And she had grown quieter and quieter with each day had spent her nights prowling through the too big too empty house instead of sleeping. And then one day she'd come to him, dressed in her Anbu gear with her jackal mask, strapped to her belt, and she'd smile at him, kissed his cheek, and said goodbye, and then left on her mission. Only a corpse had come back. But he isn't floundering anymore. Now he has Orochimaru, in addition to Kakachi. Orochimaru, who is quick-tempered and haughty, and yet still loyal, with a slyly hidden and often macabre sense of humor, who is gentle with Kakashi when he thinks no one is watching, and skilled at healing, no matter how talented he is at killing, who needs someone to care for him, even if he himself can't see it, needs an anchor and a tether and some sort of bond to remind him that he's human too, and not just a detached observer playing God. Sakamo stretches his arms above his head, twisting slightly to pop his spine, and then flops back with a contented huff, relishing the cool of the grass on his skin. He's looking forward to his three weeks of leave, even more so than normal, because for the first time in two years, he has someone besides his infant son to share the time with. It'll be good, and it comes at just the right time. Any longer a stretch, and Sakamo would have to sit on a Rochimaru or something of the sort. That proud bastard thinks he's been hiding his exhaustion well, but Sakamo has come to know him and can see the lines of stress that lie deeper than normal around his eyes. Oh, well, for dinner? Kakashi asks, and Sakamo blinks his eyes open to see his son standing on startlingly steady legs above him looking down. It takes a moment to work through the boy's words because he's fairly certain that Kakashi isn't advocating to have the snake Sanin as their main course. But once he does, he smiles. Probably, 
He affirms, reaching out to offer Kakashi a hand. But he's got a meeting with the Hokage first, so we'll have to wait a bit. Kakashi eyes the hand with clear disdain, then turns and makes his slightly wobbly and awkward way back to his toys, where he sits down hard, shakes it off as though it was intentional, and returns to his game. Sakamu chuckles to himself because that was definitely an expression picked up from Orochimaru and murmurs to himself, Ouch, what a burn! You're cuddling him and you expect any different? A low, sharp voice says, familiar and welcome, as an equally familiar figure steps out from behind a fall of wisteria. Aren't you the one insisting he's going to be a prodigious shinobi? Try treating him as one mutt. Sakamo sits up and opens his mouth to protest, then immediately snaps it shut again as his eyes narrow. Orochimaru is even paler than normal, so pale that Sagamo can actually see the furious flutter of his pulse in his throat and temples, blood dark under the skin. Golden eyes are dilated blank when Orochimaru hasn't successfully hidden anything from him in months. There's no tremble in his hands, too much of Shinobi for that, but Sakamo suspects that there would be if he had an ounce less iron control. Sakamo has never seen him like this, not in an entire year of friendship, and he can safely say he doesn't like it. At all. Abuchimaru, he demands, rising smoothly to his feet, and it's no surprise at all that his voice is a bare decibel above a growl. What happened? Oh, well! Kakashi says before the Saiyan can answer, climbing back to his feet and all but hurling himself at Abuchimaru's legs. Oh, well, stay for a night! Play with me! There's a long, long pause, and then... Very slowly, Orochimaru bends down and scoops Kakashi up in his arms, hoisting him into his customary position on Orochimaru's hip. Kakashi laughs, latching onto Orochimaru's hair, and then adds, Please seek and find! Please, Oro! For another moment, Orochimaru's blank mask holds. Then, with a long, soft sigh, he wraps his arms a touch more firmly around the little boy and murmurs, I'm sorry, cub. Not tonight. He looks up, meets Sakamo's gaze over Kakashi's head. I am leaving. Something has come up, and I have a lead on Tsunade's whereabouts that I must follow. It doesn't escape Sakamo's notice that Orochimaru has entirely failed to answer his question. He has no idea what could have happened, though after the events of the past year, he no longer has quite as much faith in the fact that their presence in the village will prevent anything. And the way Orochimaru is acting... On anyone else, Sakamo might call it shaken. The decision is easily made, settled in an instant. He steps forward, catches Orochimaru by the elbow with his best genial smile, and tugs him towards the house. Dinner's waiting, he says, and plows on even as Orochimaru tenses further and opens his mouth to protest. Let's eat, and then I'll pack Kakashi's things and we can be on our way before full dark. The Hokage won't mind us leaving without passes just this once. And if he does, you can just blame it on me in a whim. Don't worry, lovely. It won't take that much longer, and then you'll be on the road with a good meal under your belt at two fearsome warriors to watch your back. He winks at Kakashi, who giggles in answer and winds his arms around Ibuchimaru's neck. We go? The two-year-old asks interestedly, and Sakamo grins. Kakashi's always been the adventurous type, though he has yet to venture further than Kanaha's fringes. Normally, Sakamo leaves him with a nurse for long trips out of the village, and Kakashi bears such things with good grace. Given Orochimaru's current state, however, Sakamo suspects that a bit of a buffer from unpleasant thoughts might be welcome, and there are few better than an eternally curious toddler. Orochimaru studies Sakamo for a long moment, purple-edged eyes narrow and assessing, and then he sighs, reaches up with his free hand, and gently ruffles Kakashi's hair. Yes, cub. He says, somewhere between resignation and humor. We're going. True to his somewhat infuriating, Sakamo will allow, character, Orochimaru says nothing at all about their sudden departure until they're several hours from Kanaha heading northeast at a fast clip. Kakashi is too young for them to take to the branches with any regularity, and he's almost too big to tolerate a sling, but the added incentive of being carried on Orochimaru's back, with constant access to his hair and a clear view of what was ahead of them, had kept him complacent until the late hour took its toll. Sakamo is a little offended that he's second best yet again in his son's estimation, but the indignity is eclipsed by the humor of the image. 
After all, the much feared snake Sanin is only slightly less fearsome when sporting a sleeping toddler and some drool in his hair. It takes very, very much effort not to laugh, but Sakuma knows exactly what Orochimaru is likely to do to his aid if he does. <laughs> However, on horribleness of the image aside, Sakamo isn't about to let his friend get away with that earlier brush off and makes sure that Tabuchimaru knows it, sending him short, sharp looks whenever they pull level as they run. And after several repetitions of this, Tabuchimaru finally gives in with a disgusted hoof and a hard roll of his eyes. You haven't a subtle bone in your body, have you, Atsakiri? He crouches, but Sakamo is aware that the only reason Orochimaru is complaining is that he feels safe enough to do so rather than keeping the aloof and icy facade he adopts around the rest of Kana. And takes it as the compliment it really is. I don't think I know that word. Sakamo agrees cheerfully because this far from the village, the tension is finally easing out of Orochimaru's shoulders and that's a definite step in the right direction. It's foreign, right? To you, most definitely, <laughs> the snake sin and mutters, but it's said with a certain measure of well-hidden fondness, Sakuma knows that besides him and Kakashi, only Sarutobi, Jiraiya, and Tsunade have earned. There's a pause as they navigate the rapids of a rain-swollen river, and then Orochimaru makes a sound in the back of his throat that Sakuma knows he picked up from one of the wolf summons and says, I believe I know why my missions have been going poorly. Poorly is an understatement. Were Orochimaru anyone else, he would have died ten times over in the last year, and that's only counting the solo missions. Sagomeo makes sure that Orochimaru takes as few of those as possible, and even that much prevention isn't enough. He grits his teeth, trapping another growl in his throat, and nods to show he's listening. It's not like he'd be doing anything else, honestly. Orochimaru glances at him, huffs softly, and looks away. Embarrassed, Sakamo translates, or, well, as close as a Ruchimaru can ever get, which is nearer to mildly chagrined. Donzo approached me. He continues flatly, though there's clearly something off in his tone. Shaken, Sakamo thinks again, though perhaps that's not quite right. He wished for me to join the root division of Anbu to uncover the traitor. It takes Sakuma a moment to connect to the pieces. In his own defense, it's after midnight, and the previous day was very long. But there's a certain sideways slant to Orochimaru's mouth that whispers disbelief, a suggestion of mistrust in the way he keeps his eyes fixed so firmly in front of him. And from there, things come together easily. Sakamo has encountered Danzo before. He's seen the man's morals at work, both on and off the battlefield, not that Donzo seems any difference between the two states, as far as he could tell. If he was indeed working to drive Orochimaru into his clutches, he clutches his fists, tries to keep his temper and protectiveness and outrage all tightly contained. If Donzo managed to sink his claws into Orochimaru, who is five years younger than Sagamo, but capable to becoming even more powerful, who doesn't quite seem to understand the need for morals or strains or mercy, Sakamo doesn't even want to think about what Danzo could turn Orochimaru into. Orochimaru walks a knife edge as it is. Add to that Danzo's manipulation, his desire for power, to keep Kanakan safe, he says. But Sakamo has seen war, has seen peace, and knows which he prefers for his son to grow up in. And Orochimaru, who came out on the other side of Root's training, would bear little resemblance to the one who went in. A breath out, a breath in... Again, and was more for luck until Sakamo could fully control himself, and he says softly but implacably, Tell him no. Orochimaru doesn't look at him. Somehow, Sakamo, I doubt Shimura Danzo is the type to accept such an answer easily. Sakamo doesn't push, nor does he deny the curl of warmth that arises in him at the use of his given name. This is the first time Orochimaru has ever called him by it. A step in the right direction, indeed! He takes one more swift glance at his best friend and his son, at Orochimaru and his boldness grace and the way he's so very careful not to jar Kakashi, at the way Kakashi is tipped forward over Orochimaru's shoulder, comfortable with Kanaha's snake summoner, as he never is with his nurses, one hand fisted in night-dark hair as he dreams. This is his pack, his pack of three, hard one, and a little battered, and very, very dear. And if Danza wants to take any part of that away, 
Sakamo will fight him to his very last drop of blood and beyond. He takes a breath, breathes out, and bounds two strides forward to run at Orochimaru's shoulder. So can I ask where we're going? He says cheerfully. Or is that on a need-to-know basis? That gets him an eye roll, as usual. Sakamo has only ever briefly been around Jiraiya and Tsunade, granted, but he kind of wonders how the three survived being on a Ganin team together without somebody ending up buried in the forest. Between Orochimaru's dry snark and aloofness, Tsunade's lack of patience and monstrous strength, and Jiraiya's cheerful perversion and defensiveness, well, they must have been very interesting to train, to say the least. If it didn't have any respect for the sun memory before, that alone would be enough to earn it. There's a town, Orochimaru allows after a moment, on the border of rice paddy country. It's well known for its sake, and Tsunade is nothing if not one to drown her sorrows. If rumor is anything to go by, she's there and losing all of her money to the gambling dens. That kills a lot of Sakamo's good humor, and he has to fight a frown. He is biased, probably. But it seems cruel to him that Tsunade left without thought to her teammate and is now indulging her vices in an attempt to forget while Orochimaru is being targeted by someone after his sanity, if not his life. Not that Sakuma will say anything of the sort. He knows the softness that comes into Orochimaru's eyes when he mentions his female teammates. Remembers in their first real conversation when Orochimaru said how fond he looked when he spoke of her teaching the medical need to. Tsunade was insistent that Jiraiya and I learn at least the basics before she would let us go off on solo missions. That, more than anything, had been what captured Sakamo's attention. Softness, where none had been before. Not weakness or anything of the sort, but humanity in a man who was supposed to be a soulless monster. And he thought, if they were wrong about this, what else could be false? Because it was a mystery and enigma, something new and edged with a metal death dry scales for scent that had been a puzzle of its own. Uruchimaru had smelled like killing ad loyalty in equal measure, and it hadn't fit with what was said of him. Little does Sakamo knows now. So, are we going to drag her back to Kana? He asks, keeping his voice light. Orochimaru glances at him, clearly startled, as they round a bluff and hit one of the main roads. The Sanin slows slightly, adjusting Kakashi's sling as he contemplates his answer. I had not considered it, he says, eyes narrowing as they flicker to the waning moon above. Tsunade had her reasons for vanishing. After Dan's death, there was nothing for her in the village. Moreover, there were too many memories. I do not blame her for leaving. And yet the faint tilt of his mouth says he doesn't understand it, not really. After years and years of being told that loyalty to the village is everything, Sakamo doesn't blame him. Orochimaru sees things in a strange mixture of shades of grey, with moments of black and white wound through in startling contrast. A good part of it seems to be his own strange morality allowing for things he's been told. Sartobi's morals, taken as unwavering truth when, if left to his own devices, Orochimaru would not deign to care about such things. There and then, watching his best friend contemplate his former teammate and her disappearance, seeing the sharp slant of his brows and the darkness in his golden eyes. Well, Sakamo resigns himself to doing everything in his power to make sure that Tsunade accompanies them home. Not for himself, and not for Kanaha, but for Orochimaru, who needs her in the way that a compass needs to know north. It's a feeling that Sakamo can understand all too well. But he wonders just a little, because he's always been a bit selfish, what it will mean for his friendship with Orochimaru, and what will happen when Orochimaru regains all that he's lost. Maybe then Sakamo will be replaceable. He doesn't like the thought of that at all.